Good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Endowed Chair in Criminology and Criminal Justice Lecture, and my honor to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Lewistiqui people, whose ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy tribes and nations, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. Of late, we've had the opportunity to consider the significance of land acknowledgements, of what they say and of what they mean. Tonight, as we contemplate the rise and causes of hatred, the importance of understanding colonialism as present, current, and not a relic of the past is clear. Tonight's lecture is being live streamed so I encourage each of you, wherever you may be, to reflect on the traditional lands on which you are situated, to join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of Indigenous people who have cared for these lands, and to think about how the ongoing promise of truth and reconciliation can be made real in your own work and your own lives. The Endowed Chair in Criminology and Criminal Justice is made possible through a generous endowment to the university. And what this endowment allows us to do is expose students to new, innovative research and issues within the field of criminology and criminal justice. To that end, I'm quite pleased to bring you tonight's symposium, featuring the work of three scholars, specifically curated by this year's Endowed Chair in Criminal Justice, Dr. Allison Lunny, who I will more properly introduce later this evening. The title of this evening's presentation is Interrogating Hate, Manassian to the Military. It will examine the rise of hate crime and extremist groups in the military, online, in the news, and in our courtrooms. 2021 Statistics Canada data that reports a disturbing upward trend in police reported hate crime, with a 37% increase in the last year alone. The first year of the pandemic saw the greatest number of police reported hate crimes since comparable data began to be collected in 2009. This suggests that tonight's presentations are both timely and critical. We begin with a presentation by Dr. David Hoffman, who I will now ask Dr. Lunny to introduce. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Hoffman. Uh, Dr. Hoffman is an associate professor of sociology at the University of New Brunswick and the director of their criminology and criminal justice program. His research has been funded by government agencies such as Public Safety Canada, Statistics Canada and the Department of Defense, and includes area, um, such areas as far-right extremism in Canada, hateful conduct in the Canadian Armed Forces, terrorism, and political violence, charismatic le leadership, and transnational criminal networks. Dr. Hoffman. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to situate my... Oh, I need my uh, clicker first, if you don't mind. Sorry, technical issues. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to situate myself here. I, I'm, I'm a wanderer. I like to move. I like to, I like to keep things loose. So um, not that I, I want to separate myself from my colleagues or anything like that. But uh, let me start by, by apologizing for the giant UNB letters here. This is the generic, you know. They really, really want you to know that, that anything on their generic PowerPoint slide has to be from UNB. So I'm proud to represent them. But, you know, it's a little overdone. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'm here to talk about my uh, research uh, on right-wing extremism in the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, I am currently uh, the co-lead of a, um, a three-year network funded by the Department of National Defense, uh, specifically looking at uh, how um, the right-wing ideologies that are present in Canadian society, but also within the Canadian military, intersect with military culture and uh, may contribute to um, what they call uh, hateful conduct within the military. So what I'm presenting today is really uh, a problematization of this issue, um, how things have changed within the Canadian military in the last four to five to six years. I, I mean, hateful conduct has been in the Canadian Armed Forces 
for, for about 100 plus years in, in various forms. But since 2016, which is one of these big watershed moments in uh, Canadian right-wing extremism, uh, the issue of right-wing extremism and far-right ideologies has come to a forefront in uh, the Canadian military to the point where uh, the Department of National Defense and senior leadership in the Canadian Armed Forces have acknowledged it and are um, taking concrete steps to dealing with it. So, this button, right. So, um, a common lament between myself and, and uh, other colleagues who work in right-wing extremist research, um, really the, the landscape for terrorism research prior to around 2015 had myopically focused on Islamic terrorism, uh, sorry, Islamist terrorism, the vast, vast, vast minority of extremist uh, Muslims who, who twist their religion into uh, a violent interpretation. Um, and these, this, this myopic focus tended to focus on uh, homegrown terrorism, particularly uh, around the time of the Toronto 18 um, in 2006 to, to roughly again, to, uh, and other iterations up until 2015. As a result, and uh, again, this is part of this, this overwhelming lament, uh, right-wing extremi right extremism has largely been overlooked in uh, Canadian scholarship, but also uh, by Canadian security forces as well, uh, security agencies uh, and the military. Uh, it took roughly until about 2015, again, for uh, the annual Public Safety Canada report to start uh, identifying the growing threat of right-wing extremism, and it, every year since, um, the, this threat has been uh, over, uh, emphasized and uh, emphasized again. And uh, this threat is a real threat. Um, this, is, this is, again, um, part of the research that, that I'm involved in and I've published in this area uh, as recently as earlier this year, um, particularly gathering open source data, looking at, at larger trends. There has been uh, an alarming, growing uh, threat, again, post-2016, a massive increase, almost an exponential increase in right-wing extremist ideologies and activities in Canada. Uh, but within the particular case of the military, two very recent cases, and if you've been following the news, uh, uh, Patrick Matthews uh, is, is a member of the base, which is a an accelerationist right-wing group that is trying to bring around an, uh, a violent overthrow of the Canadian government to establish a, a white supremacist Christian republic, uh, as alarming as that sounds. He's been sentenced to nine years in prison in the United States for um, arms violations there, as well as uh, the, uh, the gentleman at the bottom, Corey Hurin, um, last July, or last July or two Julys ago. Man, time flies. COVID, COVID makes it all blurry, right? Um, he was responsible for the attack on Parliament, uh, where he rammed his truck uh, through uh, the gates at Rideau Hall and uh, attempted to locate uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. And uh, both of these individuals have uh, previous military ex experience. And this was a giant wake-up call for the Canadian military in, in more than one way um, about the threat that uh, of members of the armed forces and uh, uh, members of the armed forces who uh, may uh, engage or embrace right-wing ideologies. Just a, a, a quick kind of scan as well. Um, I've been making this case over and over that since 2015, 2016, the, the, the landscape of right-wing extremist um, beliefs and, and activity in Canada has changed exponentially. And it's not just the election of Trump, there's, there's larger issues as well. In tw uh, prior to 2015, um, uh, some of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Barbara Perry and Dr. Ryan Scrivens, produced some uh, produced groundbreaking work on um, the landscape of right-wing extremism in Canada, and they they indicated there was roughly a hundred groups around then. Since then, uh, in updated research, which I'm involved with with Dr. Perry and Dr. Scrivens as well, uh, we've we've located 300. That's, a, that's three times as much within a five-year period. Uh, with chapters uh, uh, across every province, uh, and more alarmingly, um, uh, paramilitary-style militias for the first time appearing in Canada. These are the, the types of, of individuals pictured there on uh, my left, your right, who uh, essentially engage in, in military-style drills. Uh, we have not had a paramilitary presence in Canada prior to 2016. And these are uh, identified by American police as one of the, the greatest threats from the far right. And they're in every single province now. 
We've also seen a demographic shift in terms of uh, the far right uh, and their adherents being older, educated, and better employed as opposed to young, angry, disenfranchised men. Uh, we've seen coalitions being formed between various groups. There's cooperation. And we've also seen, uh, as again pictured on the left, uh, an interest in arms training, which indicates um, a desire to engage or possibility of engaging in violence or military style violence. There are causes from, uh, for concern uh, when thinking more about right-wing extremism and the military. And uh, the um, uh, La Meute, which is a Quebecois uh, right-wing group uh, founded by two former, vet uh, form veterans, former, uh, former members of the Canadian Armed Forces, claimed to have around 75 members. Uh, several, uh, and they claim for somewhere in the, the double digits, the lower double digits, 10 to 15 of them are, are in the military, uh, or so they claim. Um, there's also been efforts and, and clear indications um, to the point where, where we've noticed people on, on message boards and, and in various manifestos uh, expressing a desire to reach out to police uh, and uh, military recruits in order to uh, essentially gain expertise when it comes to uh, weapons training and military tactics. Um, probably the most famous example is, is a threat on, on a now defunct site called Atomwaffen. Um, which is the, the German word for, for nuclear brigade, I think, something along those lines. Um, one of these Nazi fantasies, right? Um, the MPCIS, which is an internal uh, document to the Department of Defense, uh, indicated in 2018 they, they identified 53 of their members uh, affiliated with hate groups and hate crime. And we've had a, a series of high-profile cases which are all uh, involving violence or the potential for violence, which is disconcerting almost yearly until COVID really hit from 2017 onwards. And this, uh, this idea of um, uh, active RWE groups, right-wing extremist groups, seeking military expertise, people with military training, firearms training, is disconcerting because, again, this, this signals that they are looking for people who can train them in the use of arms and military tactics, which, which translates to uh, preparation for violence, and this is this is one of the main reasons why um, myself and my colleagues are are interested in this. So, what do we know? Um, there's very limited uh, good primary research right now on the nexus between right-wing extremism and the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to give full credit where credit's due. Um, there's, uh, as I mentioned, there's limited research, but one of my uh, master students who defended her thesis in, um, let's just say 2021, uh, this summer, she, uh, as part of one of these larger research projects, actually uh, is amongst some of the first um, uh, contemporary, she produced some of the first contemporary uh, primary research on uh, Canadian armed uh, forces and the right wing nexus. So I'm going to actually be uh, presenting on uh, her work so, uh, and, and full credit where it's due. So uh, if you're, I highly recommend, it's, it's, in the, it's in an institutional depository as well, Shana Perry. But um, she discovered through interviews with uh, uh, close to 20 or so uh, Canadian Armed Forces members, um, long in-depth interviews, she, she discovered uh, certain trends which are disconcerting and which uh, is now informing some of our, our uh, current research on this nexus. She identified both structural uh, or social structural issues within the makeup of the Canadian Armed Forces, as well as interpersonal causes that may contribute to uh, the adoption of right-wing extremist ideologies by uh, current and former members of the military. The other interesting thing she found was that uh, right-wing ideologies tend to occur with more frequencies in different parts of the army, and I'll, I'll make that case. There are um, there are uh, different tasks, different different brigades, different divisions, and, and different, um, well, the army is multi-layered and multi-tiered, so uh, right-wing extremist ideologies happens to, uh, happens to crop up with more frequency in certain parts, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to spoil the surprise, I suppose. So what we have here is uh, a pretty basic, but, but a, a still very good, um, uh, uh, illustration of how uh, someone within the Canadian Armed Forces may come into contact with and uh, possibly adopt right-wing extremist ideologies. 
at the top there is uh, the right, the RW narrative. This is this is uh, what I like to term the the right wing idea sphere. So all the all the noise you hear out there, or you see, or these types of people like to consume from uh, both mainstream and more uh, cryptic parts of of the internet uh, and and media sources and news sources, where uh, they pick and choose what makes sense to them, what resonates with them and what, uh, um, what helps them craft their own narratives. Uh, for a small percentage of these people, uh, they, they will dive into uh, particular narratives surrounding white Canadian nationalism, uh, particularly when it comes to um, uh, ID their own identity and more, pr more predominantly the perceived threat to their identity. There's, there's this large threat narrative around their identity and the idea that their way of life or, or what they deem as the proper Canadian, white, masculine, hegemonic way of life is under threat and under attack. Um, this leads to uh, the adoption of other, other core ideas, negative framing of immigrants, so blaming, uh, othering, outgrouping um, to, to tie to the, the loss of identity, um, attacking, attacking certain um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, attacking certain policies meant to foster inclusivity, um, as well as the demonization uh, of, of immigrants and other groups. I need to speed up. I think I'm taking too long. Um, the narrative is also uh, drawn from several different wells, wells, the internet and the dark web obviously playing a, a big role in the adoption and, and the, the creation of these narratives. Um, uh, Perry also noticed that there's uh, a certain trend amongst at least the people she interviewed uh, of sheltered or naive attitudes. Uh, and it's not saying that, that these individuals are stupid. It's that uh, usually they, they tend to cleave towards uh, reductionist or binary worldviews, viewing the world in black and white, which is always a dangerous thing when it comes to, to hate and uh, hate crimes. The world is not black and white, it's shades of gray, right? Um, she also noticed something institutional as well, that um, the, for uh, veterans who, particularly those who were deployed overseas, she, she keyed into the idea of, of um, uh, generational trauma in the sense that um, people go overseas, they, they become traumatized by, by certain groups which can be othered. And I'm not saying this works with everyone, but a certain, certain minority of them will then uh, seek to uh, deal with their pain and trauma by demonizing the other, by, by, by buying into this narrative. And again, this is not the, the majority, this is the minority. Um, and this can be transmitted in, in the barracks, in, in the trenches, and so on and so forth, and, and becomes uh, a part of, not a major part of, but a part of, of military culture as well. Um, the, and uh, in terms of the second point I was making, the uh, right-wing extremist ideas tend to um, uh, be located in the certain parts of the military that focus on um, fighting. I mean, this seems a little bit more, a little bit uh, cleaving towards common sense, but in the com it's the combat arms, the, the infantry, the people who, who are, are essentially being trained to fight and, and to kill as part of, and well, you know, it's within this whole entire Canadian defensive narrative and so on and so forth. Um, but it's, it's not the people sitting at desks and doing the research, and it's not, not the people sitting uh, you know, and doing intelligence. It's the people who are out there, who are, who are in the dirt, who are face-to-face uh, uh, -face with the enemy and so on and so forth. They're the ones who, who uh, um, uh, embrace, well, get traumatized, that's one. But there's also this aspect of hyper-masculinity, right? Particularly within the military, so, um, which, which translates and can segue into, for again, a small number of these individuals, into toxic masculinity, which is a uh, key component of far-right ideology. The idea of, of, of the supremacy of, of not only you know, white Christians, but white Christian men, men, traditional gender roles, men who rule the household, women in their traditional positions, and so on and so forth. And most notably, and, and this is probably uh, one of the, the uh, I find one of the most interesting takeaways, um, the um, far-right narratives tend to, within the Canadian Armed Forces, tend to crop up more within uh, groups like the Canadian Rangers who are reservists. And this is the big takeaway uh, and the really interesting part of Perry's research. Um, 
reservists uh, and the rangers in particular tend to, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I have another slide in, in a moment or two, but there's less oversight. Um, they tend to come from rural, they tend to be situated in rural er areas. Um, there's less uh, sc uh, scrutiny from the, the higher ups and so on and so forth. Um, creating what, what's uh, been labeled as an enabling environment. Uh, the Rangers are uh, a particular division that, that were noted for high rates of, of right-wing extremism. These are, are individuals in uh, northern parts of Canada who uh, essentially serve as, as the military presence in, in areas that are sparsely populated and, and so on and so forth. Think of, of uh, you know, uh, pioneer folks and uh, uh, pioneer military-style groups in, in, in harsh northern environments. Um, and so they're in the north and in small communities, and their isolation, um, coupled with um, uh, certain demographic factors, um, it's been noted, it was noted by many of the, the people that, that Perry interviewed, that it, it's an easier breeding ground for this type of mentality, again, having to do with less scrutiny, and so on and so forth. And this is a list of, of uh, within the last five to six years, I believe, of individuals uh, from uh, the Canadian Armed Forces who engaged in or were, were publicly uh, tried for hate or hate crimes. And uh, a little more than half here, uh, even more than half, well, I, I forget the numbers. I should be able to count, but it's late. Uh, the idea here is uh, the reserve is overrepresented. And again, as I, as I was saying, the regular force uh, tends to have more scrutiny. There tends to be uh, uh, more oversight by, it's a full-time job, there's more oversight by, by senior officers. Um, therefore, this the, the types of, of right-wing narratives are easier to catch and easier to stamp out. Um, there's limited freedom, and uh, re uh, full-timers tend to move away from home. Reserve forces tend, it's a part-time job, uh, there's more freedom of movement, and they stay close to home. Um, and in areas where uh, um, where there there might be institutionalized uh, uh, institutionalized um, histories of hate, the literature calls it. I'm not saying rural areas are are all these. Every single rural rural area has a history of hate, but in small, isolated, um, uh, homogenous communities. Um, Reservists who serve there, if there is a history of hate, it's easier to spread and easier easier to, for it to make its way into the Canadian Armed Forces. So to wrap up, what's being done? Uh, I already alluded to this, but uh, the Canadian Armed Forces is taking this seriously. And they've taken concrete steps and they've enacted uh, what's called uh, hateful conduct policies with the most recent iteration in 2020 meant to stamp out and, and adopt a zero tolerance policy for members who engage in, in what they term hateful conduct. Um, and they've also engaged in, in academic and stakeholder um, uh, training, well, academic and stakeholder initiatives as well as training. And this is my chance to do a little pitch and blurb for, for the research network. But So this is the network I was talking about, again, funded by the Department of National Defense, but with uh, we have autonomy and, and uh, we have researcher independence. But this is a, a national network from, uh, with researchers from, from every province who are um, looking to various questions involving the right-wing extremist uh, and Canadian Armed Forces nexus. And uh, we will be um, trickling out reports over the next three years, if you're interested. Uh, you just need to Google RWCAF for, for those of you who are. And uh, thank you so much for your time. That's my email if you'd like to uh, contact me with questions after the fact. Thanks. Thank you, David. That was uh, a very informative uh, presentation. Our next presenter is uh, Arunita Das. Uh, Arunita is a PhD student at York's Social Legal Studies program in Toronto. Her research interests lie within hate speech and hate crime in Canada, racial violence, colonization, and feminist criminology. Her current research examines how right-wing political activists use social media to mainstream their politics and garner support from individuals across Canada. Okay. 
Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Lenny, and thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman, for that talk. I learned a lot about Canadian Armed Forces and their hateful conduct and the hateful conduct policies, and I'm interested in, in seeing how that, how that grows, so thank you. So my research examines uh, how far-right political activist groups in Canada use social media to espouse hate speech and the challenges with the legal regulation of online hate speech. With the boom of interactive social media, hostile and offensive hate content has increased around the world. Particularly in the last 10 years, Canada has witnessed an insurgence of far-right political activism motivated by white nationalism, and social media has proven to be a significant medium that foments far-right activism, the circulation of online hate, and the organization, organizing of far-right activist networks. I look at how far-right political activists use social media to mainstream their politics and garner support from individuals across Canada, and the role of legal regulation of online far-right politics and hate speech in Canada. I also examine the challenges and possibilities uh, for, of the legal regulation of hate speech in Canada in ways that balance constitutional protections concerning freedom of expression protected under the Charter. So what is free speech and what is hate speech, basically? So before I go into the details, I wanted to make a note of who falls under the umbrella of far-right uh, political activism and why I chose to use that term to describe them. Um, far-right political activism often advanced a version of nationalism framed as white power, grounded in xenophobic and exclusionary understandings of the perceived threats posed by groups such as non-whites, immigrants, gay and lesbians, and feminists. And if you remember from Dr. Hoffman's presentation, uh, it sounds pretty similar to describing right-wing extremism and right-wing extremists. And a lot of people I research, the tweets I research fall under the definition of right-wing extremism. However, I'm using the term far-right political activism to describe the individuals because that's how they describe themselves. And I thought that's probably what I, what I should use since that's what they describe themselves. Um, but it's generally the same. And I use this to describe far-right groups or right-wing extremists that espouse a wide range of hate speech rooted in white supremacy, anti-Semitism, white nationalism, and broadly racism in Canada. So the use of social media and social networking to chat, search, and exchange knowledge, express thoughts, and engage with others have rendered social media to be a convenient and effective platform of interaction. I found Twitter to be an interesting platform to study because of its accessibility and its ease with which divisive opinions can be expressed online. Specifically, um, the paper I'm gonna present today maps the tweets of a couple of prominent far-right political activists to understand social media's role in advancing hate speech and also proliferating uh, far-right extremist politics in Canada. I kept the names of the individuals I took tweets from confidential mainly because there wasn't a lot connecting their background to the content they post online um, that I could find anyway. And also when going, going about how to research this topic, I was talking to Dr. Lenny about this, and she was talking about the importance of safety when searching for things online because you don't want anything traced back to you. And also Dr. Hoffman recently was talking about getting threats from the research she was doing, so I got paranoid and thought just keeping the names out for the sake of this presentation was probably a good thing to do. But yeah, by studying these tweets, I dissect the ideo ideologies, attempting to understand where this hate stems from and to which audience to this form of speech, what this kind of speech can reach. I chose to look at the tweets of three Canadian far-right political activism, activists with a large audience, and I learned a common theme among this, these tweets uh, were that far-right political activists typically construct themselves as victims of multiculturalism and normalize hate and difference by bringing in false, unsubstantiated claims that appeal to individuals wanting to find answers to their problems. And I'll show you what that means in the next few slides. So this is an example of one tweet that I saw. So generally in their social media pages, uh, far-right activists don't espouse speech that is directly an incitement of hatred. It's not just, I hate, insert, minority group, but it's rather that their posts are about uh, uh, projects violent, dehumanizing, or other in language that targets minority communities. A common theme found among their tweets tend to depict white people, specifically white males, as under attack and on the course to being eliminated as a human race. They cite liberal politics and the rise of anti-racist movements as the reason white people are now, according to this one person's thinking, unable to advance in society. 
This language in this tweet connotes that something has to be done, otherwise their perceived hegemonic superiority and position in society is threatened. Um, the tweet that you see above you, uh, for example, suggests that while white men are smarter, they're not given the same opportunities as everyone else for college admission, despite having good grades and impressive test scores. I, I hope you know that's not true. Um, uh, the language serves as a credible alternative story, uh, constructing a particular version that places white men as superior, and their superiority is threatened. As well, uh, discussing children books and college admission, uh, this tweet is clearly uh, targeting younger men, perhaps beginning to think about their careers and forming who they are. And this message acts uh, as a tool for recruiting younger white audiences to learn racist discourse. In the words of Blazak, the fear is that as history, science, and children's books are adding diverse content for inclusivity, the voice that is diminishing is the hegemonic, straight, white male perspective. For younger men who are still developing their identities, this message seems to produce a reason and solution to why they're having feelings of frustration and strain. And it's the same thing in this next tweet. Uh, the tyranny that this uh, far-right person is referring to are vaccine passports. Um, but a common theme throughout their tweets are about strength in numbers um, and fighting against their perceived discrimination for advancing their perceived truths and ideologies. This tweet also had a picture of two men, uh, one that was, uh, one of the people were the person that posted the tweet and the other was what he called a recruitment and both of whom were white, white men. And throughout their tweets, a lot of this person's recruitments to fight tyranny are white men as well. And the words, we need more men like him, refer to white men as a strong model person um, if they fight against this tyranny. And the opposite, if you don't fight against this tyranny, you're considered weak and vulnerable if they don't fight against it. Um, as well, this indicates that white people that do not fight against this perceived tyranny are somehow betraying, betraying their own race but enabling the freedom of groups and communities they hate. And to younger male audiences, this is a message that can signal a crisis of identity when trying to understand and learn typical masculine traits that they need to have and a hegemony of white heterosexual male power, and what that looks like. And then in this next tweet, uh, I chose this tweet because there was studies that suggest there was an increase in far-right hate propaganda after Donald Trump was elected in 2016. Um, I won't take too much time talking about him because he's not He's not really relevant anymore, I don't think, but Trump validated a climate where far-right activists can espouse hateful speech without fear of re repercussions. Following Trump's win, visible minorities were targeted for several hate-inspired incidents. Uh, across Ontario and Quebec, several racist and homophobic posters filled with pro hate propaganda were scattered across neighborhoods. And these freedoms to enact racial violence is what the person behind this tweet is afraid of at the time US President Biden was elected. Um, so clearly this person sees a connection and validation of having Trump as president um, as some sort of a safe, savior of the white male hegemonic person. It's unclear whether this person actually believes their own words. Um, if you're reading this tweet that if Biden becomes president that it means that certain groups can just begin committing crimes without any sort of legal recourse. Um, and also the urgent tone employs narratives of racial difference mediated by images, pictures, or tales that shape preconceptions of targeted groups. The tone in this tweet is broadly negative, uh, depicting the states as under siege by African Americans and the politicians that support them. The, and I put this in quote, the you is speaking to then white people, uh, instilling fear among the person, his audience, his followers. Um, exasperating an imagined threat in far-right discourse. The urgency in this person's voice calling the election a life and death situation connects anti-racist rhetoric and the Black Lives Matter movement as actions towards eliminating the race, for in their mind these movements present threats to white superiority. And it's important to look at these tweets and to look at the language behind these tweets because these words, despite it not specifically saying I hate this specific minority group can depict harmful images that can be internalized by its audience, regulated, and then normalized to the public, perpetuating ideal representations of individuals and producing assumptions of the targeted group of individual. So while this person is discussing the American context, this incitement of hatred and advocating for racial superiority invokes racist sentiments to their Canadian follower, followers 
constituting harms on targeted communities in this post. And these symbolic boundaries then create distinctions, and this imagined difference is what ultimately leads to producing hate and can spark hateful speech and action. And there are many others, like this far-right individual shown above in this tweet, espousing hate speech on social media. And as Dr. Hopson mentioned uh, in his presentation, there's approximately 300, maybe more, far-right uh, and experience groups in Canada. And in serious cases, this can lead to racial violence offline, as these far-right activists uh, use social media to spread their philosophies, expand their influence, and attract supporters across Canada, with detrimental effects on the individual, community, and society level. There are studies that point to a clear association between digital hate speech and actual hate crime, as well as online hate speech and offline violence against targeted communities. These impacts include the spreading of misinformation, victimization, and psychological distress and risk of violence. They said the, the studies suggest that exposures to or consumption of hate speech can have multiple consequences for individuals, particularly associated with changes in behaviors, attitudes, and emotions. So from this perspective, online hate speech is not just, a, they're not just words, not just a set of utterances, but also actions carrying real world outcomes. Regarding emotional impacts, uh, studies talk of anxiety and depression as being associated with exposure to online hate material. Um, specifically, Tynes in 2008 uh, made a study of being, uh, targets of online hate speech are linked to depression among young African Americans. And the slide above shows just some real, real world consequences hate speech has. And it's important to take a moment to consider our feelings for these actions. Um, when I pulled this article, it was in the like, uh, later part of 20, like June 2021, and now the number of indigenous children uh, burials uncovered are in the thousands now. And it's important, I, I put up this slide because I, I I want you to show you that it does exist in Canada, and racism is not, does, does not only exist in Canada, but is also in our history as well. And just generally to give an overview about the Canadian laws that must be updated to, uh, to regulate hate speech online in Canada, unless there are extreme forms of hatred and contempt, hate speech and hateful expression is protected under Section 2B of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This section contends that everyone has the fundamental right to freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication. And largely, Canada's laws around hate speech fall under, um, sorry, fall under definitions of hate propaganda, advocating for genocide, publicly incited hatred, and willfully promoted hatred against an identifiable group is criminal under Section 318 and Section 319 of the Criminal Code. Uh, and to clarify, an, an identifiable group is defined as anyone distinguished by color, race, religion, um, age, sex, sexual orientation, mental or physical disability, gender identity, gender expression, and additional analogous groups. On Twitter's hateful conduct policy, similarly to a lot of social media um, platforms, posts that explicitly or violently incites harm on targeted group are taken down. This applies in cases of violent threats, hateful imageries, uh, repeated epithets, and other forms of speech that can directly cause harm to communities. Nonetheless, Twitter is founded on the principle that users can post freely unless there, are, uh, there, are, is, there is a direct violation of their terms of service. And typically, the way far-right activists and other similar users write in their posts promote hateful narrative implicitly in a way which is not necessarily illegal or in breach of a platform's terms of service. And typically, the way uh, far-right activists and other similar, uh, uh, well, there are, and sorry, in doing so, the hateful posts that have the potential to cause harm remains unmonitored and continue to grow and develop audiences across Canada. While these are some of the laws that regulate hate speech in Canada, it becomes complicated when assessing which type of speech online falls within these definitions, what is actually considered hate speech, and what is considered free speech. It becomes more complicated when speech is posted on the internet, as all pages of the internet come from different parts of the world, with different domains and jurisdictions, and it becomes more unclear which countries regulate what is written on the internet. And also, um, I will add it on here, recently following the hate-motivated violent attack on a Muslim family in London, Ontario, in June 2021, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada introduced uh, amendments to the Criminal Code 
the Canadian Human Rights Act, and the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Uh, the Government of Canada introduced these amendments as a means to better protect Canadians from hate speech and online, online harms, and this is directly quoted from their news release. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how these proposed amendments will be applied in the coming years and how they connect the studies done by the Parliamentary Commission, which studies the effect of online hate speech and how to regulate this activity. I hope the actions by the Government of Canada shed light on the importance of regulating hate speech and provides meaningful solutions that move towards protecting both free speech and also targeting communities, uh, the targeted communities from harm. Um, so, nonetheless, further research and subsequent cases must focus on how hate speech espoused by far-right activists itself constitute harms to community, as it's important to examine the social media pages of far-right political activists as they reflect their set of values, ideologies, belief systems, and links to other websites and organizations that can produce harm and violence to the individuals that they target. So, I hope this was a helpful snapshot around some of the issues around online hate speech and far-right activism and the harm of posting harmful language. And thank you so much for listening. Thanks. Thank you. That was a terrific. Um to have those two presentations back to back uh, in terms of the ways in which they inform each other, but I'm going to save some of these comments for <laughs> later when we ask some questions. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce um, the keynote speaker for this evening, our endowed chair in criminology and criminal justice. Dr. Allison Lunny is an associate professor in the law and society program at York University. She holds a PhD in criminology from the University of Toronto as well as a master's in English literature and a master's in theory and criticism, both from the University of Western Ontario. Her undergraduate degree for undergraduates here presently was in semiotics, a field which she puts to good use in her 2017 book, Debating Hate Crime, Language, Legislatures, and the Law in Canada, a book that is widely used and a chapter of which is assigned reading regularly in my advanced criminal law class. Her research examines sexuality, hate crime, and hate speech, representation, and the law, and there's a healthy dose of critical psychoanalysis in some of her work as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lunny to uh, give her remarks. Thank you very much, Carla. Um, wasn't sure if I was going to use my, uh, my glasses to read this or just uh, go by the enhanced font. I'm hoping the enhanced font lasts. <laughs> uh, good evening. Thank you for this honour and opportunity to speak with you about the topic of hate crimes. As a warning, there will be imagery and words used in this talk that are examples of hate, so I just want to put that up front. Hate crime and ideologies of hate are sadly very much a part of our cultural reality, with assaults on Asian Canadians in this time of COVID crisis, threats to government both here and across our border by militia, militarized white nationalist groups, and anti-vaxxers. Riots and insurrection instigated by right-wing supporters and alt-right adjutants, and an, and, and an alarming number of vehicular homicides motivated by extreme racist and misogynist ideologies. These acts in and of themselves are profoundly disturbing, but when motivated by ideologies of extreme hate, hatred, I feel an extra chill run through my body as if touched by a ghostly premonition of what is next to come. In the 1990s, there was a growing social movement, both here in, and in the United States, that called for policy consideration and legal recognition of crimes motivated by bias and hatred as deserving of enhanced penalty. Minority groups long suffering from discrimination and violence called on governments, police, and legal officials to create policy and law that would address the victimization of these targeted groups. According to this growing social movement and the burgeoning hate crime scholarship of the 1990s, the category of, quote, hate-motivated crime and its attendant legal enhancements addressed a unique need because, as the argument went, hate crimes hurt more. So what are Canada's hate crime laws? There is actually nothing in the Canadian Criminal Code that names 
quote, hate crimes per se, as an offense. Rather, the term hate is found under two distinct sections of the code. One set of provisions deal with the public incitement of hatred and the willful, willful promotion of hatred. These are hate speech provisions, and I won't be discussing those today. The other section where, where one finds the mention of hate is in the enhanced, uh, is in the, sorry, is in the sentencing principles. By 1996, Canada had made changes to its criminal code under the sentencing provision, whereby evidence that an offence was motivated by bias, prejudice, or hate based on race, national or ethnic origin, language, colour, religion, sex, age, mental or physical disability, sexual orientation, or any other similar factor, would be deemed an aggravating factor at sentencing. More recently, the provision was amended to include gender identity or expression as a protected characteristic. Typically in hate-motivated defenses, the police will provide evidence to the Crown about the offender's biased motivation. Evidence gathering is done by both officers on the scene as well as detectives from a hate crime or intelligence unit. They take into consideration the comments and or actions of a suspect during an incident, the victim's perception of the incident, the timing of the occurrence around or on cultural significant dates, uh, for example, would be Hitler's birthday, the presence of symbols, for example, the swastika, and the history of the community and current world events. That is, they make meaning from the evidence, decipher it, as you will, and classify it as hate-motivated or not. Remarking on the potential difficulty of classifying an incident as hate-motivated, the Toronto Police Service's annual hate crime statistical report explicitly notes, quote, it is sometimes difficult to classify an occurrence with complete accuracy, end quote. Once the evidence is gathered and classified as a hate-motivated crime, the Crown will then ask the court at sentencing to, to consider it an aggravating factor, thereby increasing the sentence. In reasons for sentence, the judge will often include a statement admonishing the offender's bias, saying something to the effect that hate has no place in Canadian multicultural society. The question of how one deciphers hate, and additionally how law recognizes hate in cases of murderous violence in particular, is curious to me. For instance, the judge in the case of Alec Manassian, a self-proclaimed proclaimed incel who used a rental van in a mass, mass casualty uh, attack, skirted the issue of hate motivation in her reasons for sentence. In a cursory study of cases of homicide and hate motivation, it is extremely rare for the issue to be accounted for at sentencing. Two cases, though, come to mind. The first coming to mind is that of the gay bashing homicide of Aaron Webster by four young offenders. Despite no submission from the Crown on hate motivation, the judge took it upon himself to make notable mention of hate motivation in his sentencing of the youth before him. His mention is very much a legal anomaly. The other case involved the brutal death of a 65-year-old Sikh temple caretaker who was stomped to death by five members of a white supremacist group in 1999. To my knowledge, it is the only homicide case in which the enhanced sentencing provision was raised by the Crown Attorney. Charged with the murder of Nirmal Singh Gill, the five pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of manslaughter. The Crown then urged the court to apply the enhanced sentencing provision to impose a life sentence. As evidence of the hate motivation, the Crown submitted a racist letter written by one of the offenders while in jail. The letter was written to one of the avowed and convicted white supremacists who was found guilty of murdering James Byrd Jr., an Afro-American Texan who was chained, chained to the back of a pickup truck and dra dragged for miles to his death. Dear John, the letter reads, quote, you should have been given a medal. That, an insert N-word, should have been left by the side of the road as an example to those who would cause the destruction of our glorious white nation, end quote. In his sentencing, Justice Stewart rebuked the racial motivation, calling it repugnant and brutal. Noting the attack was clearly racially motivated, he stated, Nirmal Singh Gill is dead simply because he was Indo-Canadian. He was attacked because he was different from the accused, end quote. 
Citing the enhanced provision, Judge Stewart hoped the prison sentence of 15 and 12 years, respectively, for the offenders would, quote, send a message that violent hate crimes will not be tolerated, end quote. In another case, nearly 20 years ago, David Rosensweig, a visibly orthodox Jew, was stabbed to death in his Toronto neighborhood by a young male with a shaved head. The man had been agitated and causing trouble at, at a local kosher pizzeria. When confronted by staff, McBride, the man, apparently shouted, quote, mother effing Jews, end quote, moments prior to the fatal attack. It had all the dynamic components of a hate crime, an assault by someone who looked like a skinhead, who was heard yelling a religiously charged epithet against an identifiably observant Jew in a Jewish neighborhood. Immediately, leaders in the Jewish community condemned this act of violence as a hate crime and urged police to investigate with that in mind. As one prominent leader of the, communi of the community viscerally stated, quote, it smells like a hate crime, end quote. Initially, then Toronto Police Chief Julian Fantino told media that the police would consider this in their investigation but ultimately came to the conclusion that the evidence did not support the belief that Rosensweig was targeted by McBride because he was Jewish. The Crown Attorney commented that religious hate, quote, was not an issue, and that hate did not appear to be the motivating factor in the murder. According to the Crown, quote, the fact Rosenve Rosensweig was Jewish was a coincidence. This rather shocking conclusion was supported by evidence that McBride had a black girlfriend. In making sense of this hate crime, I am unclear why race stands in for religion. Animus towards one is not equivalent of animus towards the other. As McBride, McBride's girlfriend problematically stated to the media, quote, obviously he's with me, so it can't be a hate crime, end quote. So how do we understand hate crime? What are its characteristics? Hate is a powerful, effective emotion. It is viscerally felt by the one who hates, and in its projection is profoundly felt by the one impacted by the rage and detestation. The violence of a hate crime is spawned and inspired by, the most base, by this most based emotion, one that abhors, detests, demonizes, vilifies, vilifies, debases, and is disgusted by its constituted other. Hate expresses. It transpires in a field of social communication. The manifest objective of the hate crime is to communicate its coded violence to its despised other. The painted swastika on the doors of a synagogue, the burning cross planted on the yard of a Nova Scotian biracial family, the ripping of a hijab from the head of a Muslim woman all convey meaning. The meaning might be to intimidate, to harass, to evoke historical trauma, to demean, to threaten, to harm. In hate's projective communication, it has the potential to impact some bodies and yet not others. In some cases, the hater may misidentify his target, and so when the epithet is hurled, calling to the intended receiver, it is not recognized and the harm may not impact the receiver. Communication theory demonstrates this claim. The racially spewed epithet, the message is hurled by an emotionally heightened person, enraged in some way, to its intended receiver, the target. If the message resonates with the receiver, then the communication is successful. Damage has been done. If it is not recognized, not felt and understood, not incorporated, then the, com then the communication has failed. In part, Successful messaging of hate depends upon a mutually recognizable field of social, political, and historical relations. Put simply, hate relies on a shared set of cultural and historical codes in order to be successful, to have negative impact to harm. Let me offer another example of how hate impacts, owing to a large extent on this field of social, political, and historical relations between hater and hated. In Black Skin, White Mass, Franz Fanon analyzes, through a critical use of psychoanalysis, his own experience as a man of color in a racist, colonized society. The exclamation, look, a Negro, uttered by a girl when looking at Fanon, 
uh, demonstrates the way in which language in a field of social and political oppression and racism has the power to strip Fanon's subjecthood from him and reduce him to the colonizer's abject other. Fanon writes, quote, sealed in that crushing objectivehood, my body suddenly abraded into non-being. I burst apart. Now the fragments have been put together again by another self. This is an imprisoned self, writes Fanon, reduced to object objecthood by the white colonizer's interpolation. Questioning how this comes into being, that is, from where does this power come to reconstitute personhood into abject objecthood, Fanon writes that the white man had, quote, woven him out of a thousand details, anecdotes, stories, battering him down by tom-toms, cannibalism, intellectual deficiency, fetishism, racial defects, slave ships, and above all else, sure, sure good eaten, end quote. Note how this field of communication is structured over time, that is, historically and through power relations that create and perpetuate the racist world of white power and black subjugation. With the utterance of one word, the white girl invokes an entire history of racism and colonialism as that one word, word holds within it the power to resonate long-standing historical harm. Hate garners its power not only from the effective through the force of the visceral, but also through what Judith Butler calls the iterative. In Fanel's example, the racist stereotypes and vulgar caricatures spoken, written about, drawn, sung, taught, reinforced by law, reproduced again and again, have the power to constitute radical alterity, the racialized other. Hate crime scholarship has long recognized the psychological impact of hate-targeted violence. Studies cited by Paul Ignansky in a seminal essay, quote, Hate Crimes Hurt More, evidences the psychological impact of targeted hate violence. For the victim, the symptoms experienced by the trauma of hate violence were more severe and were experienced for a longer duration of time than other crimes of violence. The reason behind this difference, Ignansky remarks, is that the hate crime victim is targeted because of their hated identity. As one hate crime victim in Ignansky's study remarked, quote, I know I was targeted and I was chosen for something about myself that I can't change, that is at the core of my being, that I wouldn't want to change, that is unique to who I am, end quote. For this victim, the hateful violence strikes at their very core, at their very essence. It is an ontological harm, but one that seems different than Fanon's, as the victim here offers resistance to the hateful interpolation that seeks to destroy their subjecthood. From this study, Ignansky offers another insight. He notes that harm is not restricted to the primary victim. Harm amplifies through identification into what he calls waves of, waves of harm, spilling out into the victim's community, creating a secondary site of trauma. So when a burning cross is planted and set ablaze in the front yard of a biracial family, as we saw in Nova Scotia a number of years ago, the threat of white supremacist violence as embolized by the burning cross of the Ku Klux Klan is communicated more broadly and speaks to other members of the black community and to those who dare cross the ideological lines of racial division. Barbara Perry offers other insights into the constitutive nature of hate violence. In her model of what she calls doing difference, Perry writes, quote, Hate crime involves acts of violence and intimidation, usually directed towards already stigmatized and marginalized groups. As such, it is a mechanism of power and oppression intended to reaffirm the precarious hierarchies that characterize a given social order. It attempts to recreate simultaneously the threatened, whether that be real or imagined, hegemony of the perpetrator's group and the, quote, appropriate subordinate identity of the victim's group. It is a means of marking both the self and the other in such a way as to reestablish their, quote, proper relative positions as given and reproduced by broader ide ideologies and patterns of social and political inequality, end quote. She gives an excellent example of this dynamic in the case of a gay bashing. 
To the homophobe, the gay man represents a threat to their normative and hierarch hierarchical structured ideas about gender and sexuality, in which binaries of male-female, dominant-subordinate, penetrator, penetrated, are thrown into disarray. To the gay basher, the violation to the hegemonic order of gender and sexuality is deserving of punishment and, quote, correction through violent repudiation of queer identity. In the hurled epithet, effing faggot, and this is, I warned you about the words, effing faggot, um, emphasized by a punch to the face or a kick to the gut, the basher marks the gay man as, as his radical other, while simultaneously demarcating, demarcating himself as not that. In that aggression and violence, in that aggression and violence are hegemonic, albeit problematic, markers of masculinity. Victimization is constituted as weakness, subordination, femininity. Following Perry's model in this particular act of, quote, remedial violence, masculinist heterosexism is restored. It is no coincidence that hate groups adopt historical signifiers. Emblems, patches, insignia, flags, uniform, chants, tattoos from previous regimes of oppression, brutality, and conquest. These objects are already imbued with a history of violence. The swastika, the hanging noose, the burning cross, the Confederate flag are symbols full of hate-filled history. The display of, the, of this, uh, if I can start to start my slides. Thank you. <laughs> the display of these symbols is meant to cause harm, meant to intimidate, meant to evoke a violence of the past. In theorizing the power of iteration, Judith Butler writes that it is this reiterated acting or reproduction, quote, that is power in its persistence and instability, end quote. This reiterative adoption of symbols and ideologies from histories of hate and oppression are powerful because they are persistent and unstable. And it, and it is to this, of, to this state of instability that I'd now like to turn. Okay. Thinking about Butler's ideas about the power of citation, I'd like to look at a couple of photos from the Charlottesville torch parade uh, that opened the white supremacist Unite the Right violence. Here we see the image of a torch-lit procession of angry white men. The sheer spectacle of hundreds, perhaps thousands of people, mostly men, marching in orderly file, carrying flaming torches, at the pitch of night has a dramatic and eerily traumatic effect. I recognized its resonance immediately, thinking of Lenny Riefenstahl's Nazi propaganda film, Triumph of the Will. This Charlottesville Tiki Torch March was an act of iteration that both reproduced and commem commemorated Nazi torch rallies in their ascension to political power. The march was deliberately staged to evoke this traumatic historical memory. But it was not a replica. It was an iteration. In its unstable nature, Butler argues, the iteration is adaptive. It responds to ch changing contexts and living history while simultaneously evoking cultural and historical memory. The mockingly poor substitution of Polynesian tiki torches for Nazi torches and of the banal suburban outfit of polo shirts and khaki pants for the highly stylized and imposing Nazi uniforms make little difference to the chilling effect of these images. In part, as Butler argues, the terror lies within its, in, it, with, within its inexact mimicry and its ability to adapt to fit the guise of the new right movements. It is the unfixed nature, the instability of the irreterated signifier, whether that be the flag, the uniform, the rhetoric, that allows for its adoption, reconfiguration, adaptation, and modification in order to be responsive to new political imaginaries of threat. As we know, the Unite the Right rally ended with a horrific act of violence and terror. James Alec Fields, Fields Jr., an avowed white supremacist who kept a, a photo of Adolf Hitler by his bed table, deliberately drove his car at high speed into an anti-racism anti 
protesters killing Heather Heyer. He was charged with and pleaded guilty to all federal and state charges, including 29 federal hate crime counts and one count of racially motivated uh, violent interference. Sentenced to life in prison on the federal hate crime charges, he also received an additional and excessively symbolic 419 years on state charges. This violence is another example uh, in which the vehicle was the method of harm. Other examples of vehicular homicide come to mind. Uh, one was mentioned by uh, Aranita Das in, uh, involving uh, the Muslim family being uh, basically gunned down by a car in London, Ontario. There is the 2016 extremist truck attack in Nice, France, uh, where a 19-ton cargo truck was deliberately driven into crowds of people celebrating Bastille Day on the promenade resulting in the deaths of 86 people and the injury of 458 others. And sadly, closer to home, there was the 2018 Toronto van attack by incel follower Alec Manassian. There is no question, legal or otherwise, as to whether Manassian drove the van that killed now 11 people and severely injured 15 others. The legal question was, did he have the intent, the mens rea, to murder and attempt to murder his victims? His defense argued that Manassian, who was diagnosed at a young age with autism spectrum disorder, was not criminally responsible for these offenses within the legal meaning of that provision. The legal question became, quote, because of Manassian's autism spectrum disorder, was he incapable of knowing that his actions were morally wrong, end quote. The decision by Justice Malloy concluded that the not criminally responsible defense has not uh, was not established by the defense's argument and evidence. In my, in my lay opinion, her judgment was thoughtful and just. Manassian, or John Doe as Justice Malloy chose to address him, was found criminally, was found criminally responsible and guilty on all 26 charges. Interestingly, she deferred sentencing into 2022 to await the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in the appeal of Alexandra Bissonnette on whether prisoners can be made to serve murder sentences consecutive, consecutively. Uh, you might notice uh, the sentence I talked earlier about the US being highly excessive. Canada typically does not have, we have concurrent sentencing, uh, so we don't have you know, four life sentences, that type of thing. But uh, there is an issue before the Supreme Court. Recalling Canada's history of mass gun violence, Bissonnette, in a targeted anti-Islamic attack, used a semi-automatic pistol to shoot up the Islamic Cultural Centre in a suburban of Quebec City, killing six people and injuring five. With this in mind, my full analysis of the Manassian case is in abeyance until I, re until I reflect and study Justice Malloy's reason for sentence in 2022. I will, however, Note a few things that deserve remark. Minutes before the speeding, minutes before speeding the rental van through blocks and blocks of noontime pedestrians, Alec Manassian posted the following statement on Facebook, and this is what's before you. Private recruit Manassian Infantry, triple zero ten, wishing to speak to Sergeant Forchan, please. And then there's a series of number which actually were his military numbers. Uh, he was uh, not successful in that particular endeavor. The incel rebellion has already begun. We will overthrow all the Chads and Stacys. Hail the supreme gentleman, Elliot Roger. The interesting thing about this post is that there is nothing denotatively or obviously hateful about the statements, unless you know the language, codes, and history of the incel movement. Until the field of effective communication is made sensical, the post carries little power to harm. The post is not meant for outsiders. It is not meant to be a warning or a direct threat to its intended targets. It is an internal covert communication riddled with coded signifiers like the names Sergeant Fordchan, the Supreme Gentleman, Chads and Stacys. According to incel scholars uh, like Winnie Chan, Maria Skaptura, and Bruce Hoffman, the incel community has increasingly become extremist in their masculinist and misogynist views over the last 10 years. Theirs is a worldview shared 
in alternative network platforms like 4chan and Reddit, uh, Reddit shaped by their grievance of their inability to form sexual relationships with women. Dispossessed of their seemingly masculinist right to have unfettered sexual access to women, they're bitter, chauvinistic, and potentially dangerous individuals. Much of their coded narrative despises feminism, and as noted by the Anti-Defamation League, evidences a, quote, convergence of politicized, politicized misogyny within far-right activism, end quote. Despite what seems innocuous and infantile, Manassian's message signals violence throughout. We can identify it in the militaristic staccato of the author's voice, in the militarized address by rank, and in the call to rebellion. A murderous history of hate-motivated violence against women is specifically re referenced in the hail to incel icon, Roger Elliott, a disturbed and disgruntled misogynist who in a series of attacks by gunshot, stabbing, and vehicle, vehicle ramming killed six people and injured 14 others. In evidence attained in Manassian's psychiatric and psych psychological assessment, it is clear that he notes that incel ideology was a part of his motivation for his attack, despite the exaggeration of some of his claims. He told the doctors that he fantasized about mass killings and that he, quote, enjoyed reading negative, hate-filled comments about women on incel platforms. Despite acknowledging that his victims were random, he said his preference was to kill women and that he, quote, would have preferred to hit more women. Justice Malloy, in her Reasons for Judgment, makes it clear that she does not believe Manassian was motivated by incel identity or ideology. At the moment, I am unclear what to do with this, so it will sit with me and sit with you, and I want to leave you with one final image from the carnage of the Unite the Right violence. It's uh, on your, what would that be? Your right. <laughs> um, the sign uh, on this uh, adaptation of an American flag where all of these uh, mementos and commemorative flowers were left for Heather Hare uh, at the scene of her death. It says, if you are not outraged, you were not paying attention. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much um, to all of the speakers. So we now have an opportunity to ask them some questions. Um, generally, the audience is a little shy about that, so I'm going to get us started. Um, and I will ask the panelists, just pose them a couple questions to pull out some of the themes, maybe, from all three of the presentations. And then we're going to open the floor um, to some brave individuals who I know are out there just won't be able to sleep tonight until you ask a question. So don't worry, if the chance is coming. But we're going to start, though. I'll sort of get us started a little bit. Um, so one thing that I had sort of jotted down here that I'm kind of curious to ask all of you about is this, um, if I can characterize it as a, I think e each of you in a certain way talked about the discourse in um, both hate speech and in some of the posts that are made um, by extremists as a threat narrative. And I, so I'm sort of curious about the relationship of this threat narrative to identity, particularly um, the role of symbols in this, as um, Dr. Lani was speaking near the end, uh, and whether this is sort of about um, evoking a, a state of, um, a time or an identity that is in some way more stable. And th so that there's a, um, I guess I'm interested a bit in e each of your perspectives of, on this notion of uh, the connection, let's say, between threat narrative in some of this hateful discourse and uh, identity. So does anybody wanna? Sure, <laughs> sure I'll, I'll start. Um, the, 
the the discourse of threat that the uh, the perpetrator feels under threat feels some way uh, violated. Some, the narrative is something's been taken away from him. There's an undermining. There's a collapse. Uh, you know, Western society is under attack. Uh, uh, you know, feminism brings dissolve to the the you know the correct order of gender relations, and so on. Um, you know, too many immigrants coming in, taking away my job. So there's this there's this um, notion. Uh, that there was this idyllic place where all things were stable and good, and then in some way, uh, something, uh, feminism, immigrants, Jews, <laughs> gays, have in some way uh, uh, thwarted this. Um, I would like to say that, you know, things change, um, and hopefully uh, we advance and progress uh, we don't regress, but things are constantly changing. Um, but what I'd like to stress is that this is an idyllic fantasy. This is uh, a nostalgia for something that was never there. That's that's my opinion. Uh, but they see it under threat. And I think, as uh, Dr. Hoffman mentioned, there's often an inversion in identity and how they, they perceive themselves as victims, where, in fact, they are victimizing uh, their constituted other. I have a, um, I agree with everything you say, uh, obviously, but uh, I have a, 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 not a different answer, but a, a, an alternative answer in terms of um, something that um, I've observed as, as someone who's been studying the far right for the past five, six, seven years or so. Um, this threat narrative is everything that Dr. Lunny said, but um, I have also observed um, th that it's part of a concerted effort by the far right to rebrand itself. There's been a rebranding in the last 10 years or so. Um, for those of you who were uh, around in the 90s, um, the image of the 90s far right adherent is you know, the, the, the masculine skinhead, Doc Martens, cuff chains and that kind of thing. Who, and the idea is um, the whole entire, uh, a big part of the, the, the movement at that time was, was uh, proactive in the sense of let's go out and cause terror, let's go out and beat up minorities and so on and so forth. It was um, uh, outwardly violent uh, and seeking to cause harm to these other groups. Um, again, this narrative has changed in the last 10 years uh, and, and I think it's, it's more of, uh, out of an effort to recruit um, a changing demographic in the sense that it's no longer these these jackbooted thugs and and that evokes you know the glory days of of um, of uh, SS tyranny and all that jazz uh, and it's more uh, if you don't do something um, what it means to be a white Christian male in Canada will be uh, inevitably stamped away uh, that we are the victims they aren't the victims and. Again, this is more to, um, I, I uh, highly suspect that this is, is a recruitment strategy to uh, reach out to uh, another generation or the next generation of far right. So um, again, just, just emphasizing, Dr. Lani is absolutely right, but from a strategic sense, um, this is, uh, I, I would say this is, uh, the threat narrative is, is a concerted rational effort to advertise and to, to reach out to other people. Yeah, I would say Dr. Lenny and Dr. Huffman covered pretty much all the things that I wanted to say, but uh, if I was thinking about the use of social media with far-right activists and the audience that they appeal to, typically uh, the audience that, uh, when I searched the people that liked the tweet were younger white men, and um, research does suggest that uh, people that uh, are recruited eventually into far-right uh, extremist groups were from the lower-income families. So it seems, uh, it suggests that uh, younger white men, uh, younger male individuals that were vulnerable or in a position where they felt like they were still forming their identity or didn't know who they were yet, uh, these messages were a shining vision of hope and renewal, showing that there is still hope that they will gain their superiority through these messages. Okay, so to, p to pick up on um, David's point here about this alternate, this kind of changing brand, let's say, I'm, I'm wondering a bit about if we imagine this as recruitment, how does that um, impact uh, the law's determination 
of when something is in fact hate motivated. So that in a way, I'm wondering how strategic that rebranding is so that we start to see charter rights come up against each other with this free, this is freedom of association. I'm just getting together with other like-minded individuals. This is recruitment. This isn't terror. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I guess I can wax a little bit more poetic. I, I'm going to leave the, the socio-legal stuff to the experts and uh, defer to their expertise, but um, uh, that, that excuse is, has been part of uh, main strategies of, of prominent far-right Canadian groups. I'll, I'll mention, I'll, I'll name names because that's important, but Soldiers of Odin, for example, a uh, far-right group inspired by um, a Finnish group that was established in 2016, um, white supremacist, and uh, in Canada, what they tend to engage in is um, good works. Uh, so they'll, they'll, they will go and feed the homeless. Uh, and meanwhile, with, with their, their jackets and, and all that jazz. On, on the outside, they present themselves as good old Canadian boys, uh, and they, they encourage other good old Canadian boys uh, using some of the narratives that, that Aranita uh, mentioned in, in those, those great examples in the tweets um, to put a veneer of legitimacy uh, on their actions. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure if this is to circumvent um, some of the, the laws. I'm, I'm personally not sure they're that sophisticated. They're not stupid, but um, they're not, I, I'm not sure if they're that um, sophisticated. They might be. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing what my colleagues have to say. But uh, this is more of a, um, uh, to, to get around that whole entire, they, they would never, there's a lot of these groups would say we aren't, aren't a hate group. Meanwhile, in their private forums and in private settings, they're, they're very much a hate group. Um, and this, again, recruitment strategy, but also might circumvent the socio-legal side. Yeah, I mean, I've never heard of, uh, you know, infringement through, uh, assembly. Uh, it's usually a speech issue. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I don't know how that would play out. Until there was something actually criminally done, uh, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, and what is said and done in private also has a lot of protection, right? Charter protection. So uh, I don't know how that would play out. Um, yeah. I guess I was thinking about it in terms of your critique of the sentencing as a, that there is, there's an element of interpretation there before a judge can determine that something's been hate motivated. And that if there's a change in the discourse away from hate, even if it's merely a branding exercise, I'm wondering how that impacts mm -hmm. judicial interpretations of the, of the speech. Got it. Um, so I, I think it's very difficult, and I, and I think both um, uh, you know, my colleagues' uh, presentations uh, demonstrate the way in which um, strategy is changing. Um, memes, for example, cartoons, uh, humor. Uh, we're seeing that now in the news as well around, you know, comics maybe making public statements about individuals, was that hate speech and so on. So the coded language, the language that can't be obviously identified as being hateful uh, or threatening or targeting um, slips away. And um, with respect to how it's being monitored online, uh, there are, you know, algorithms and things like that's being created to attempt to identify these speech issues. Um, but the speech issues are far too slippery and encoded and, and, and sophisticated to be, I think, identified properly. Um, I've seen some memes that were shocking on Facebook. I actually reported, but I'm not going to say what it is. Um, but I reported it. And I, I usually, I, like that, I've never reported before. I reported this. And they said, no, it was not hate speech. And it's like, yes, it, yes, it is hate speech. <laughs> Take my word for it. And I had it appealed, and they still determined it wasn't hate speech. And believe me, it was shocking. But it was a joke. It was done through a cartoon and a, a, a joking kind of linguistic statement. They didn't catch it. And they, they, they changed so rapidly. Their strategies changed so rapidly. that It's so hard to track. I mean, within um, there's been a trend in the last 18 months that I, I, as someone who looks at this for a living, I only clued into it like last month, uh, which is manufactured outrage, which is the idea that uh, a lot of these these social media sites will let you post um, like Twitter posts, uh, like like Aronita did, but completely anonymized. But what what far right actors have been doing is um, essentially catfishing. They will uh, create parody accounts using humor. Uh, and uh, present themselves as uber leftists 
uh, who make these outrageous statements, then they are then anonymized and posted on these sites and, and, and held up as examples of the, the insanity of the far left to manufacture outrage. Um, and how do you police this? How do you, how do you um, uh, especially after it's been anonymized? Um, and, and they're not even that thinly veiled. There's, there's one example that's like uh, Journalist Excellence Worldwide, which is a, a very thinly, acron uh, th thinly veiled acronym for Jew. Uh, and um, and they go off and, and make these these uh, what appear to be reasonable statements that become f more and more outrageous, and then again they're they're curated and picked and then and and repurposed into far right propaganda. But uh, the wording and, and the coding is leftist, um, uh, but it's used as as far right propaganda. And this is this is you know cutting well cutting edge, but cutting edge ish, um, and and incredibly difficult to to. Um, uh, police, let, let alone legislate, um, and it's. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to sound too whiny, but man, is it tough. <laughs> yeah, and just to go off what Dr. Hoffman was saying, uh, also, how do you dif distinguish the difference between what is actually comedy uh, posted in the name of com comedy versus actual hate speech, and what does that look like under legal regulation? And also, how would you punish something like that? Would it be a? I think currently it's fines under human rights tribunals, uh, hate speech and promoting hatred, but is there gonna be a criminal sentencing? Uh, so what does that look like when punishing and how does that differentiate between punishing regular crimes? And I say regular, like crimes that aren't hate motivated, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that my feminist legal studies class is tuning in because we're looking at humor as a source of civilized oppression on Wednesday. So, see the relevance here? Okay, so, who, do we have any questions from the audience, folks that would like to? We don't bite. So just before you answer, I'm going to repeat the question in case folks couldn't hear it. So um, the question is for Aranita, and it's about um, the number of likes and retweets. We're veering into an area I know nothing about. Um, but likes and retweets, um, and how popular a poster needs to be to... That's the difference between a nut and an activist in terms of a follower base. Why, why didn't you just, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. When I was going about doing this research, I thought it was actually going to be really hard to find hateful content posted by far-right activists, but unfortunately, it wasn't really that hard. And um, I chose Twitter for this presentation because it was easier to find posts that sort of covered the themes that they talk about, but they also have other social media profiles. BitChute is a popular one for far right activists, and I basically chose um, I chose to analyze tweets that of people that had BitChute accounts as well, because that's generally more of a free speech far right uh, political activist site. And um, the three people that I chose had over 500,000 subscribers, um, which is why I chose to follow their Twitter. It's not as prominent on Twitter because of the hateful conduct policies and things, but they're not they're not hard to find if you want to look more into them. That was an excellent question, and I'm going to butcher it right now. <laughs> but it's a question about whether or not the panelists have found that people who engage in hate speech or hate crime tend to be un uneducated, and that it's a form of, what was the second part? It was good.
Right, so uh, labeled as lesser than and engage in these acts as a means of um, feeling better about themselves. I, I will paraphrase in a rather rough way. But. Okay, I'm gonna start. Mm -hmm. um, the demographic for um, non-radicalized uh, extremist hate crime, so the average hate crime. Um, you know, someone gets assaulted and there's an epithet hurled. That's, uh, or uh, community or religious property is vandalized. Okay, those are the most common hate crimes. Um, the demographic for those crimes tends to be uh, young males. Um, so 16 to like 25 uh, tends to tends to be white males, um, but um, so just because of that age group, right, they're, they can be teenagers, so they're high school educated, so they haven't, right, we can't establish. But I don't want to, I want to be clear that there's not necessarily a distinction around uh, intelligence. Um, I think some of the, uh, the leaders and the um, uh, organizers of these movements and of these ideologies sadly, are extremely bright. Um, some of them, like Richard Spence, have PhDs. Um, so it's, it's not about that. I think some might feel disenfranchised and they might be younger and so thus not as well educated yet or inexperienced, but it's not a question of intelligence, sadly. Um, yeah. They, they aren't, um, well, there are, always, there are always exceptions to the rule. They don't generally, generally tend to be stupid. Um, uh, as a movement um, or as individuals. It, it, it's less about intelligence and more about identity. It's exactly what the, the same sort of themes. Um, I'm just repeating what my colleagues have said. Um, and that essentially was, was going to be uh, what you mentioned there with, with the leadership, uh, which is one of my interests. Um, as a sociocriminologist, I'm interested in how, how leaders affect uh, per violent movements in particular, um, they're going to come from, uh, a, 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 they're going to be cut from a different sort of cloth. Um, they're, they uh, traditionally, again, in the 90s, in, in the heyday of, of, of jackbooted thugs and, and whatnot, the, the uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the typical far-right scene for, for white supremacists would be an older um, uh, father-like figure or an educated man who would who would attract disenfranchised angry young white socioeconomically deprived uh, um, men um, but that again has changed um, the the um, the demographics have changed I mean with with the images with from unite the right gone are the days of, of Doc Martens gone are the days of, of leather jackets and and the alt-right and and uh, the environment from where these far-right extremists and far-right political activists uh, spawn are, are they're, they're trying to, to you know, a, adopt a, a polo-wearing, khaki-wearing, khaki, khaki wearing, um, uh, crisp, clean image uh, of, of uh, legitimacy. And um, with that comes uh, certain other, other demographic markers. As I mentioned, um, as, uh, in terms of just far-right extremism in general in Canada, um, the the trends are exactly what Dr. Lenny said, but we're seeing we're seeing older, more educated and and well employed individuals uh, getting involved in uh, different types of far right um, high risk activism. Where where and this is a new trend. So um, uh, just to reiterate, they aren't stupid, um, uh, and they're not motivated. Uh, and and it's it's not a bunch of people getting brainwashed or tricked into, into a movement. There are people who are concerned or, or who have uh, manufactured a, or adopted a threat narrative for seeking, as Aranita mentioned, uh, answers to, to complex questions with pretty simple solutions, with black and white uh, binary solutions. Yeah, I don't have anything extra to add apart from it's also important about what you're exposed to as well. If you think about your own... Uh, perspectives and your own identity, how did you come about those those perspectives and identities? So it's the same with far-right individuals as well that are exposed to very particular types of content and can repeated and continued exposure to that. So if you um, if you limit yourself to only those circles, then you're gonna you're bound to only have that personality regardless of your title or education status and things. The echo chambers basically. Yeah.
So this question is about um, the uh, far-right extremists and their use of online and that they tend to be highly educated and how might this contrast, this identity, these characters is contrast with uh, terrorists and is this really just um, uh, painting uh, folks with the same brush, I think was the, so this is right, right up your alley. David. Sorry, so I, I am a terrorism <laughs> scholar and you've just asked the question that keeps me up at night. Um, uh, namely that um, uh, th there's a giant controversy in terrorism studies about what exactly terrorism is and, and the this is something that terrorism scholars have been fighting with, with governments and, and, and policing agencies. There's, there's no real consensus over what terrorism is or isn't. Um, and as a result, this causes this, this definitional ambiguity, uh, which you've tapped into. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I can go on and on. Actually, this is, I, I gave a lecture earlier, uh, uh, earlier um, this semester in my terrorism class on just this thing, and I can go on for weeks, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarize it pretty quickly. Um, not every far-right extremist is a terrorist. Uh, in the sense that that terrorism is is uh, at least in the 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 um, uh, definition that that I use in my own research, terrorism is is a rational strategy uh, used by individuals to enact some sort of political, religious, or ideological change, uh, but that employs violence. Um, these people might, as as a group, might uh, extol violence. They might um, they might uh, encourage violence, and they they might talk the talk. Uh, but it's only a very small number of them that actually walk the walk. So um, I would call this a terrorist enabling environment. These are extremists, but it's only the vast, vast minority of them that ever actually ascend, ascend uh, that makes it sound positive, um, actually ever engage in, in uh, a formal definition of terrorism, by, by, whether by the legal definition or by the scholarly definition. So um, uh, this is something I'd love to, to debate over a beer for, for the next six hours, but great, great question. But. Okay, yeah. So, so this is a question about the attack in January in D.C. and whether they would characterize this as a hate, hate crime or a terrorist act. That's a great question. Um, it really is. It really shows the way in which those you know, circles, the Venn diagram, and there's that middle piece. Um, there would be institutional definitions. There would be policy definitions of what constitutes each. And, of course, it's U.S., so it's a different jurisdiction than ours. Um, it's somewhere in the middle. Definitely terrorist. I mean, they, you know, it was organized. It, it attempted to overthrow government. There was violence. Uh, hate groups were involved. It's this weird middle space. There's ambiguity, and, and I would, um, without taking anything away from my colleague, I, I wouldn't call it a terrorist attack. I, would, I call it, and, and very publicly call it, an insurgency. So this, this uh, yes, the, there's elements of terrorism in there, um, and and it's it's what's called a functional equivalent. It, it it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, but there's a little things here and there that that make it not a duck, or a terrorist. But you know what I mean. Um, so so uh, I, I, while, while some of my colleagues uh, might call it terrorism, and, and they're kind of sort of right. My own my own opinion is it's it's. Insurgency, but but it's just what Dr. Lani said. It's it's this weird middle area, and and it's one of these things that just just keep me up at night. Um, but anyways, yeah, this question reminded me of I don't know if either of you read it, but Michael Nesbitt uh, published an article recently this year about the differing definitions between terrorism and extremism, and. Um, I'm going to summarize it badly, but uh, a lot of what the article mentioned was it comes down to how the laws are interpreted for a particular group. So a lot of, um, a lot of uh, actions uh, done by right-wing extremist groups po uh, under de by definition uh, would fall under terrorism, but it was, um, it was sentenced as a regular crime. And a lot of the focus when interpreting these types of acts go towards... Uh, racialized uh, to extremist groups, uh, specifically Islamist terrorist groups. 
even though the acts of uh, right-wing extremists are far larger than the acts of Islamist terrorist groups. So, yeah, a lot of our, our laws have a power to define uh, who's an extremist and who is a terrorist. And, yeah, it, it comes down to who has the power to interpret those laws, I, I think. Okay, I'm sensitive to the time and how long you've all been sitting there in your masks. <laughs> One last question. Great. Yeah. It's a great question, and I'm going to, again, I'm just going to do a terrible job here of trying to repeat it. Um, <laughs> so this is about the rebranding of far-right extremists and whether this, okay, has impacted hate crime statistics. And raising covert racism in the way of work uh, wage wage inequity, wage gap and work discrimination. Big question. Good one to end on, though. I would say to answer the first part of your questions, it's really hard to uh, gather whether the hate crime statistics are actually um, representative of the number of hate crimes that occur because a lot of people that have experienced in hate crime don't know whether or not it's a hate crime, so they don't report it and. People sometimes generally have, uh, generally the first kind of institution to go to when you report a hate crime is police. Um, and people, a lot of people mistrust police and don't want to report it because they, they don't want to go, to, uh, they don't know what's going to happen afterwards. So it's hard to know whether or not this rebranding actually does affect hate crime statistics because we don't know if the hate crime statistics, statistics are representative. Um, it doesn't answer your question that well, but <laughs> I just wanted to make that point. That's an important point. Um, do you mind if I go next? Um, you've, uh, you've, excellent, excellent, excellent question. Um, and one there isn't a very easy answer to, um, and I'm gonna give you probably a wishy-washy answer um, that I think is the best I can do, um, which is we can't tell um, the increase, uh, as Dr. Lani and, and Aranita mentioned, there's been a, a vast increase in hate crime statistics, uh, uh, un, uh, unparalleled in Canadian history. Um, but like any social uh, dynamic or, or social um, concept or force or anything, whatever you want to brand it, um, there's a myriad of factors. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of variables uh, that play a role in, in uh, the increase of hate crimes. The rebranding uh, that that, uh, that was mentioned and discussed is probably one of them, um, but it's only one of many. So uh, th there was another concept that was mentioned by Bayernita, the enabling environment that that world leaders like Trump have created, uh, where where people feel more comfortable in in uh, expressing hateful views. That's another. Um, uh, there's economics that are involved. There's there's um, a nationalist identity that's involved. There's cultural norms that are involved uh, that are all tied to this this increase. So um, the rebranding is part of it, but it, it is not the only one. It, it goes back to that old uh, social scientific, uh, you know, the old staple. Um, you know, correlation doesn't always imply causation, uh, and the answer uh, uh, the answer is always more complex than than um, uh, just one or two associations. So um, uh, again, wishy-washy, um, but uh, it's one of these things that I think um, can be explored empirically and should be explored empirically, but I, I think we need a little bit more distance as well. Um, I think we're still too close to this, this, um, uh, this whole phenomenon. Um, Nothing to add, wishy-washy works. <laughs> I'm too self-effacing. What, what can I say? <laughs> well, um, I really want to thank um, uh, my opportunity to thank all of you for attending. It means a lot to um, the department to see uh, folks come out and uh, watch online. Um, in particular, I want to thank uh, Dr. Lunny and her invited, invited guest, Dr. Hoffman, and the soon-to-be Dr. Das. 
uh, as well as the Endowed Chair um, Board of Trustees, uh, members of whom attended tonight. Um, in particular, I have to send a shout out to Signature Sound that has made this entirely possible, as well as the St. Thomas um, IT team. Uh, and I couldn't have done this without Jeffrey Carlton and the communications crowd, so a huge help to them, as well as to my two uh, student volunteers who checked your vaccination at the door, Joyce and Carrie. So huge help um, and shout out to them for um, a great evening. So, and thank you to campus police who were also here for our security and asked a great question. <laughs> so, um, thank you again to all of our speakers and please join me in thanking them. Uh, wish you all a safe evening.